love music and uh it just stirs my heart and just reminds me of all the goodness of God and all that he has done. So Proverbs chapter 11 and verse number 30 is where we'll begin. It is a extremely famous verse when coming to this matter of soul winning, though soul winning is something that we see uh, and commemorated mostly with the New Testament. However, there are messages in the Old Testament that we get about soul winning and reaching the lost and being a influence to a lost and dying world. In Proverbs chapter 11 and verse Number 30, it says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. You see also another similar message in Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, and verse number 3, and it says, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And so there is a wise life to live about leading people to the Lord. And a question I have been asking myself for several weeks as I've been building these messages and the Lord has led me to different things, I still have two messages sitting on my computer waiting for the Lord to allow me to preach them, but they're sitting there waiting for that day to happen. When it happens, it'll happen. Super excited about that. Yeah. But for now, the question I ask myself every single week when I'm studying for this subject of soul winning is why are we wise to win souls? Why are we wise to attract people to the gospel? The wisdom in soul winning is surrounded by discernment. It's surrounded by discernment, discerning where people are at in their life and, and discerning about what people's needs are and, and maybe their background and things like that. And some of that stuff you don't know right off the bat. Sometimes you don't have time to ask people where they've come from or where they're going or, or how their upbringing was or what kind of background they have. Uh, however, uh, you do have the discernment of the Holy Spirit to give you a direction as you speak. So why is someone wise in winning souls? Well, it's wise to have the mind of God. It is wise to have the mind of God. This is the heartbeat of God is to reach the lost and to let your light so shine before men and to tell them the gospel truth. It is a delight. And this was God's heart for all time was to reach this lost and dying world. It is wise because you are stewarding your time uh, for God wisely by reaching the lost. So it's wise to use the life in which you have, not consuming this life with self-gain or self-interest, but really submitting and giving yourself over to the Lord. It's wise to say, this is not my life, uh, therefore I am bought with a price. I'm glorifying God in my body, which is the Lord's. And so this is his, and I'm purchasing, uh, by being purchased, I'm saying, I want to steward that time wisely. Uh, why is that so wise? Because the last thing that most people want to do is go talk to somebody randomly about something that would be considered, quote unquote, controversial, right? Uh, you never know what you're gonna get. Our picture is anytime you talk to people about the Lord, you picture they're just gonna wanna throw hands, you know, or something like that, when, which I literally have never had that happen in my life and all the people I've witnessed to. Uh, I've had people not be happy, but the majority of it is either A, I'm an atheist, so they just shut the door. That's the worst thing that ever happens. And when they're out in public, they can't shut the door, they just kinda walk away, you know? But we're wise because we are stewarding the time that God gives us to reach souls. It's wise because it pleases, it's pleasing to the Lord. It's pleasing to the Lord to have the heartbeat of the Lord to reach those people. He said he's not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. It's wise because it benefits the believer as well. It does, it benefits the believer. What is the saying we say often is if you want to get a blessing, then be a blessing. And so there is something about gaining a blessing from giving the gospel or bearing fruit. Uh, attending to that and, and God allowing you to be a part of somebody's life as they develop. It's wise for men that they should care for the lost. They should care for the lost. It is wise to attract others to righteousness. This is biblically what Proverbs 11.30 is saying. Our life should attract others to the Savior. Our words should attract others to the Savior. Our, 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 our being, our heart's desire should attract, attract others to the Lord as Savior. Now, unfortunately, there are many barricades in soul winning. Now, when I worked at Lake Erie, Lake Erie Construction, uh, barricades weren't a bad thing as long as you were on the other side. When you're driving, they're a terrible thing, right? Nobody likes the cones and all that stuff. But there was several things. It was there to protect the equipment. It was there to protect the workers. And it was there to protect even those people in the traffic to keep them going in the direction they need to go. Heaven forbid if those cones weren't there. You ever seen them cut out sections of the highway and how deep those get. Did you imagine driving your car into one of those things? It would not be a good day. So those barricades are there for your protection. But in soul winning, there are barricades that the devil uses to prevent people to get to the gospel. 
preventing them and the flow or the openness of people to be able to receive the gospel witness. There are several barricades in soul winning, and these barricades slow gospel traffic. The barricades cause conflict and anger among other peoples, as you can tie this into construction time, right? Uh, You're picturing people being angry because they're not getting where they need to be. The barricades the devil puts out leads to more detours than they do direction. It's getting people to go this way and question these things. And uh, this is why the Bible warns against uh, people that are, are questioning genealogies and all these things instead of getting the solid truth of the gospel. These barricades can block routes altogether and keep people from getting to their desired destination. And the devil's very, very smart. Now, these are very practical things to not. This is not something you're going to walk away with your brain spilling out of your ear because it's so deeply theological. Uh, but they are genuine truths from an unbeliever's perspective on barricades that block people that get into the gospel. Now, whether you believe they're relevant reasons or not, these are legitimate things through all the years I've been so winning to people that these are the things that we encounter and you deal with on a really consistent basis. The number one is unbelief. I know that sounds so common, like unbelief, but really unbelief is one of the greatest barricades in soul winning. Jesus wasn't even able to do certain miracles and things in his own town because of people's unbelief. Unbelief, is what happens is their, their opinion is greater than the truth of God's word. You also often give somebody a biblical truth and they would say something like this. They would say, well, I don't see it that way or, or I don't believe that. It's not backed up with scripture. It's only backed up with our own personal interests, our own personal desires, maybe how we were raised or, or how we see the world or how we view the world. They're hard to influence and we must not try to persuade them with uh, knowledge of tactics, if you will. I've often said this, when you, when you soul win somebody or when you talk to somebody about the Lord, if you have to persuade them or convince them into salvation, then somebody else can convince them out of salvation. Uh, the job of the Holy Spirit is you are presenting the word of God to them and the Holy Spirit is revealing to them their need for the, to, for the Savior and, and their faith comes by hearing by the word of God. And so we're giving this to them, but their unbelief influences and persuades them to either receive or reject what you're giving to them. They just flat out don't believe it. Does God exist? All those types of things. Uh, It can't be real, or why is that? But we must live a life wholly submitted to God that the godliness of our life will express the goodness of the God in which saved us. Oftentimes, you can reach a person of unbelief with your own life. And I'm not talking about just lifestyle uh, evangelism. I'm talking about your lifestyle matches up with the things that you're presenting. You're having discernment to push as long as the Holy Spirit says to push, let off when the Holy Spirit says to let off, and you are close and intimate to the Lord. So when that person's unbelief begins to shed away because of maybe something that's happened in your life. Let's use the example right now. Uh, uh, Brother and Sister Hartman are going through a loss of his father. Now, I do believe Brother Hartman says he has some lost relatives. Now, through this whole situation, this would be a time for Christians to be tenderhearted and, and say words of prayer or be encouragement, bring about scripture, let them see in their life that, yes, they're, they're, they're weeping and they're sorrowful, but yet there is a hope for people that are saved. You, you understand what I'm saying? And so those things match up with the words in which you are saying. And so there is a roadblock or there is a barricade of unbelief. Why is this? There is the blindness of men. Men have closed their eyes to the wonder and power of God. We live in a world today where people deliberately choose to ignore all the things that God has given for us to see. We force ourselves to answer away the things in which we see right in front of our eyes. They chose to be ignorant of all that God has done in this world. Matthew 13, 15 says, For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. We live in a world where people are blinded. The Bible says that the God of this world has blinded their eyes to the glorious gospel, the glorious light. And that's happening. It's unbelief. We're looking right into this world of great creation and God's goodness and other believers. And they're blinding themselves through unbelief. Then we also see that it could be through, their unbelief could be coming from their home life. You know, I was not raised in a Christian home. Now, that does not absolve me of my personal responsibility to the Lord. It doesn't. However, you have people that grow up and never hear the name of the Lord Jesus. They never hear about how Jesus came to this earth and how he died for their sins and how he rose from the grave and that he died for us while we are yet sinners. You don't hear those things at home. It's not a home of of prayer. It's not a home of tenderness and reading the scripture. So 
in this training develops or unbeknownst to them trains an unbelief in them. Because why? If it's not being trained in the home, the child is still being tra trained by PBS, ABC, NBC, Netflix, Disney Plus. That's how they're being trained. Now, I don't know about you. Uh, some of you may not watch any of these things, but even quote unquote good, wholesome shows have an agenda. They have an agenda. They're training our children without even us knowing it. They're training us adults. I mean, I see it in the world today where people are being trained by the things in which we watch. And so no matter what, there is training going on in your home, whether you like it or not. And our faith can only be powerful when it is personal. Like it has to be our personal God, our personal Savior. When I open this book, I'm reading about my Savior. I'm reading about my God. I'm reading a message that applies to me. That is, this is not just the Bible. This is the Word of God that I'm holding in my hands. And that is special to me. And so here is a home life that could be derailed or it could be a serious barricade from people receiving the gospel because they were never trained to be sensitive to the things of God. You notice it says in Jude 1 20 says, but ye beloved building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. There is a building up that's happening and there are a lot of homes that are not training uh, the word of God. And I would say that there are a lot of people living their life in unbelief, though their mouth says they believe, their life is living in unbelief. Uh, the Lord of God is not prominent in the home. Uh, prayer is not ha ha prominent in the home. God is not a central fixture of their life. He's not preeminent. Uh, and so there's unbelief being taught. But also another thing we see today, and I see this ramping up even more and more now, is the intellect of men. The Bible says that it is foolishness. He calls the man that says there is no God a fool in Psalms 40, 14 verse 1. It says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. It is foolish to believe that this is all, all there is. This life is it. That's foolishness to think that our life is just for 60, 70 years and that's it. It's foolishness to deny all the evidence that God has presented before our eyes. It's foolishness to reject such, such a gift as salvation. Amen. That if God has given it to us so freely, it would be foolish for us to reject it. It's foolish to believe that the devil will keep his promises. Isn't that crazy? But I feel some days that he has more disciples than the Lord does, at least faithful ones anyway. So we see unbelief. Next thing we see is indifference. Indifference. Indifference is a huge barricade for uh, lost people and getting saved. It's not that they oppose God. It's not that they object God. It's that they just, they just don't care. <laughs> Either way, they're living their life. They're living their best life. They just want to take care of their family. They just want to go to their job. They got projects. They got things to do. They got problems just like everybody else. They got bills to pay. And they just really aren't concerned with the things of God. It's all gonna, they're, they're pantheists. It all pan out in the end. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and that's not true. Uh, to be honest with you, I would almost rather have somebody that is in direct opposition, a staunch atheist, to talk with than somebody that's indifferent. And we deal with a world that's indifferent. Uh, it's not that they're opposing it, but they just don't want it. They don't care if it's in their life. Hey, you live your life and I'll live mine. It's so dangerous. There is a barricade of indifference. But what is the remedy for this? We as, as, as preachers and we as, as evangelists and we as missionaries and we as believers who are to give the gospel have to double down on the emphasis that we're giving the gospel message out. We have to be able to get out there and we need to be able to stir things up. And I'm not saying like stir people up, like grab them by the arm and run around in circles and get them all emotionally charged. But I'm saying that there has to be a passion in what you're telling to people. There should be a passion. I believe God's people are indifferent. We sit in the church house and we listen to messages and we, we, we do our podcast and we do our own personal study, but our indifference is shown because we're not out in our communities we're not out impacting people for the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's getting worse and worse. I mean, now when I go to witness people, they look like I have 14 heads, you know? And just listen, that's thing, because that's 14 amount of stupid, okay? <laughs> but, you know, I, I go to talk to people, and it's just like, it's more and more foreign that, like, you're talking to somebody with words out of your mouth. And so that just tells me that God's people are not out there and they are indifferent as well. And that is a huge barricade in soul when people are indifferent towards the things of God. 
this indifference can have an effect on our preaching and our soul winning. Paul writes in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 34, Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. But here, here's the crazy part. This is how he ends that verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 34. I speak this to your shame. Wow. Wow. He says, you need to wake up to righteousness. Uh, you, you, need to, to, uh, you need to realize there are people out there without the knowledge of God. There are people that are just indifferent. They're dying and going to hell indifferently. Probably some of the nicest people you've ever met. So there is a barricade of indifference. We see a barricade of carnal security. Carnal security. What does that mean? There is a sense of self-security in our life. Man, that guy gave you the shirt off his back. That doesn't mean that he was saved. It just means he was generous. Sometimes to soul winning. Because oftentimes when I witness to people, they say, well, I try to do my best. I'm a good person. Not really, because I'm not. <laughs> I'm wicked. But there's this carnal security. And, and I would say this one plagues the majority of people. It's that form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. That they have set their own standard to saying, well, I'm not this guy. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not going to show up on any uh, people of Walmart sites, you know. So I'm doing okay. It reminds me of the story of the Pharisee and publican. He says in Luke chapter 18, verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. <laughs> I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as this publican. His own self-promotion. There was a carnal security in the things in which he did or has done or what he thinks of himself. And that's interesting because what we think of ourselves is often more lofty than what the reality of it is, you know? Yeah. It's almost like that guy recalling his uh, football history in high school, right? <laughs> oh, man, I was awesome. You know what I tell people when I, when I see people that like, oh, you went here to Western? I'm like, yeah. Like, oh, you, you play any sports? Yeah, I play basketball. And I played football, and I, and I ran track. And let me just end the sentence by saying I stunk at all of them, okay? I'm not trying to self-promote myself. You can look it up. I didn't do anything. I had a couple touchdowns, a couple interceptions, that was about it. And then I rode the pine in basketball all the time, and I was that spaz that ran out there. I'm like, <laughs> you know, that was me, all right? And I was no good at track either. I was 145 pounds, but I was not very fast, you know? Anyway, but the preaching that is offered to these men must leave them uncomfortable in their own self-righteousness. We're living in a day and age to where biblical preaching, let's say that first, which would be perceived as hard preaching, is not received by people. They don't want that. Uh, the other day, I found this comical, and I will not say names because I'm not, I'm not a big fan of name dropping, to be honest with you, but they took two gentlemen that are preachers, that are well-known preachers. I mean, technically, I didn't really know the one guy, but uh, you know, I had to look him up, but he took these two well-known preachers, and he said, just by their titles, tell me whose message it is. And the one was all about living your best life, and the other one was like biblical titles. And I thought to myself, this guy has... 50 to 100,000 people at his church. This guy I've never even heard of before, you know? And it's like, we want, this, we want this smooth, soothing preaching that makes us feel good about ourselves. And nobody wants to leave church feeling like garbage. But I do some days if I need it, you know? I, I mean, growing up, did anybody want to get whipped? No, but you, you should be thankful I got whipped. <laughs> you should be thankful for that. Uh, I'm not a jerk today. Well, at least not too bad, I guess. But uh, that it's that the preaching should be in a way that leaves people uncomfortable in their own self-righteousness. Is that not what Jesus did? We'll read that in just a moment here in Matthew 23, but he was calling them snakes and vipers and all kinds of things. Would that leave you a little uncomfortable? If somebody come up to you and said, hey, Noah, you're a snake. You're a viper. I mean, come on. Like, that's not what you want to hear. You want to hear, dude, you're awesome. Like, you're so detailed, clean, love it, you know, whatever. But that's what Jesus did. He was saying, hey, your self-righteousness, you, your own self-promotion, you're a snake, you're a viper. And he was very plain with them. Oftentimes, we're trying to win souls by winning their flesh. We're trying to appease them. Oh, you'll love our church. We're so kind and we're so nice. To be honest with you, me personally, I'm going to hold you accountable. I'm going to hold you accountable. 
hey, how, how's your Bible reading? Hey, let's do a Bible study together. Let's, let's dig deep in the word of God. Let's, let's hold each other. If I'm not doing something right, please come tell me. And I tell you what, every time it's ever happened, I appreciate it. Didn't like it at the time, but appreciate it now uh, in my own life. And so we have this carnal security of uh, their own self-sufficiency. Their security is wrapped up in works, yet it, inside it produces a death. Matthew 23, Matthew 23. I guess I should have been turning there since I told you to go there already. But that would work, right? Matthew 23, starting verse number 23 through verse 28, says this. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These all ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisees, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. This is lawlessness. And so there is this carnal security that, that I, I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And you know what? People like me. But that's not what the Bible says. Their direction will lead them uh, where they think it will, but it won't. Their self-security for life is the easiest life yet it's the most costly. The self-promoting life, the carnal security life is the easiest life to live because you're constantly patting yourself on the back. But it's the most costly because when life is over, it's not gonna reap the reward that you thought it would. It may not even reap you eternal life if you never got saved. What a sad thing that is to think that you lived all your life and died and went to hell. Why is that? Because Matthew 7, 13 says that the majority, unfortunately, of people will not live a Christian life. There are 8 billion people in the world, and there are 17,000 people in Norwalk. I think there's a total of uh, like 60,000 people within the surrounding area with Sandusky and all that stuff, and yet churches are closing every single day. So what I'm saying is there are people out there that would tell you, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, but... Their life is not. Why? Because they have a carnal security. He says in Matthew 7, 13, Enter ye in the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. So here we have this broad path. Few be that find the righteous path. We cannot expect a carnal man to understand the things of God. Romans chapter 8 and verse 6 through 8 says, For to be carnally minded is death. It's death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Enmity is an act of aggression. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh, listen, those that are in the flesh, cannot please God. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so this carnal security of self uh, Security in self is a barricade to soul winning. What about uh, there is a security in preachers soothing? In other words, those easy uh, listening instead of preaching the word of God. Now, don't get me wrong. There are days you preach the word of God and it's all about God's goodness and his glory and his wonder and his power. And we're the benefactors of it. And then there are other days as you go through verse by verse, chapter through chapter, that you get through these ones and you're like, ooh, ooh, ooh. You know, you walk out of here like, oh, I'm a slug, you know, <laughs> but that's okay. You know why that's okay? Because just like discipline to a child, you expect them to get better from the discipline. You expect them to grow. Uh, and just like I don't, it's not like I look, watch my kids and go, please mess up. Oh, please, I got the belt ready, just mess up, you know? No, it's not like that. And God's not just sitting up there going, smite, smite, smoot. Smitten. No. No. God does everything he can to help us in our life. That's why he's given us the word of God. But when we get out of line, he does correct us. I'm certainly thankful for that. 
But these, as preachers, we should not be up here preaching soothing words just to tickle men's ears, but we should be giving forth the word of God. Why do I say that? Because part of their judgment should lie in our lap if that's what we're going to do. If all we're going to do is preach that all this fluff and all this, you know, whatever, and not being truthful and not preaching the word of God, then part of our judge, their judgment should lie in our laps, and we should be grievous about those things. Why? Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, the beginning of it says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. All? Guess what all means? All. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was deep and theological, wasn't it? There must be a message that there is none righteous, no, not one, and our righteousnesses are filthy rags to God. Now, number four, despair. Despair is another barricade in soul winning. What a great difference from security of carnality now to despair. You go from, I can do it, I'm good, to I am so worthless, God could never save me, God could never uh, use somebody like me, and there are people like that. There is despair of life. There are thousands that have heard the gospel, yet they find themselves in a place that keeps them from coming to Christ. There's a teacher that there is, uh, there's a teaching out there that you can do nothing. If God will it or God decrees it, you will have eternal life. But we are called to preach the gospel full and free to every single man, and they have a responsibility to respond in faith to the Lord, either receiving him or rejecting him. This despair is often increasingly manifested in ways like suicide, especially nowadays. Nowadays, it's getting worse and worse. I don't know if it's because there's more social media or whatever, or you hear about it more, but it just seems like me, or every, it seems like all the time I hear people taking their own life, young people taking their own life. Why? Because they're full of despair. The devil has told them they are worthless. The devil has told them that they cannot be saved. They cannot be redeemed. They tell them that they, nobody loves them. Just recently, the Howards had one of their relatives that happened, a 15-year-old girl. For whatever reason, I don't know the details of it. But if she could have been there at her own funeral that Pastor Lewis couldn't even get into because it was wrapped all the way around the block and people waiting in the line all the way around the building, that doesn't sound like to me that somebody that's unloved. Amen. But yet there's so much despair and the devil is such a liar that people think that they have no hope. There is hope. His name's Jesus. Amen. But there is a roadblock of despair with so many people. And I want to tell you that COVID was not helpful in that. Many people left this world without their loved ones by their side because of COVID. There was created a great amount of despair in that time. But it's the despair of life. Now, this message of despair is not the message of God. It's a barricade of Satan to stop people from seeing the goodness of God. So we just see a despair in life. We also see a despair in death. You know, may our, may our pulpits be the, the message of a full and free gospel offered to anybody that would call upon the name of the Lord. There is a despair in death. Uh, there is no man greater uh, no greater opportunity uh, of this example of despair than the man that hung alongside our Savior. If anybody could say, you know what, I'm worthless. I don't deserve salvation. I don't deserve heaven. I've literally done nothing for anybody but myself. That's the dude, okay? Because he's 100% correct. And it wasn't like he's going to repent and they're going to be like, oh, you're a good guy now? Take him down, fellas. No, he was going to die. Jesus told him that, right? He said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And that is such a great example that God has placed in the Bible to show that no matter where you are at, there is never too much despair. God can save anybody where they're at and bring them to where he is. Saul's another example about that. Remember when we meet him in Acts chapter 9? It says he's breathing out threatenings and slaughter. His life was changed. You know, I believe that God and reveals their failures throughout Scripture just to reveal the hope that is in Jesus. And then don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we look at somebody like Moses and say, well, you know, Moses killed somebody too. I can get away with it. I'll just have to, no, 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 no. Well, you know, David, you know, he committed adultery. So no, we're not using it as a cloak of mischievousness. It just means if you have been to that place, or you have been in a place of desperation, or you have turned your back on God, or whatever the case is, God can still redeem you. Amen. 
that he can save you so you can go and sin no more. Amen. That is the message of the gospel. So there is a despair in death. Another barricade is the love of sin. It is a barricade. Now, here's the interesting thing about the love of sin. If that's the way you view it, live your best life. Um, if you want to identify as a cat, identify as a cat. Uh, if you want to do whatever, do whatever. Um, but that's not the truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11 says this. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteousness shall not inherit, unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. That is very clear. And as such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. So it says, hey, these people that are living this life of adultery and wickedness and effeminateness, He's saying these things will not, these people are not going to enter into the kingdom of God. So somebody that's struggling with a sexual sin in their life, maybe they have somebody in their life or, or somebody that they're consumed with this and they will not give it up. They will not repent because this part of life is all they've ever known. It is a barricade. Those that want to serve the Lord are willing to repent. Repentance is the big part of our salvation, right? Amen. You're repenting, turning from, change of mind. And God is transforming you. But some people allow their sin to be a barricade from getting saved. There is a warning. Keep your place there at, at 1 Corinthians. I'm going to go back to Proverbs chapter 5. If you, are, if you have fast fingers, you are welcome to join me back there. But Proverbs chapter number 5, verses 1 through 6, because we're going to be going back. Uh, so in verses 1 through 6 of Proverbs 5, it says, My son, attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding that thou mayest regard discretion as thy lips may know knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman, uh, woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. If I could sum this study of scripture up, look at her feet. Look at her feet. The strange woman. Where is she walking? This sexual sin, this thing for self gratification is it taking you? It's not taking you to heaven. People that you have this word where it says effeminate. Somebody that is knowingly, openly, and practicing an effeminate lifestyle. The Bible says that you're not going to enter, enter the kingdom of heaven. God calls that sin. Whether the culture agrees with it or not, the Bible has clearly said this. Adulterers, if you, if man, man, if you are living and you say, oh, I'm a Christian, but you are stepping out with some other woman that's not your husband or your, or your wife, and if, if ladies, you're stepping out with some other man that's not your husband, you are an adulterer. Amen. And I don't understand how, how we can live a lifestyle like that or coveting after sin. You know, there is a lie that the devil tells everybody that you have to give up so much to be a Christian. No, you don't. No, you don't. You give up the worst parts of your life to be a believer. Remember when, when uh, um, not Mary, Eve, when Eve took, partook of the fruit, what was she gaining from all that? The knowledge of evil. That's all she was gaining. All she'd ever known was good in God. Amen. That's right. So literally, what's she gaining? But here's the crazy thing. Are we any different? Parents, parents, how many times have you seen kids leave church because they just want to experience it? I tell the teenagers all the time that what you're running to, I ran from when I was 20 years old. Listen, the grass ain't greener on their side. If it is, it's because it's on a septic tank, amen? <laughs> and it stinks. <laughs> and the grass needs mowed still over there, you know? So, but sin is all around us. Idolatry, putting things in the place of God. Sin is a part of us. How do I mean that by that? I was once witnessing to my neighbor in Bellevue years ago, and uh, he was outside, and I was doing stuff outside, and the Lord led me to go talk to this gentleman, and, and as soon as I walked up to him and started talking to him about the Lord, he put his drink behind his back, and like, whatever, dude, I mean, it is what it is, you know, I'm, I'm come talking to him no matter what, and I began to talk to him and talked to him about his soul, and he was very, very polite and listened and kind of responded back to a couple things, and it got to the point where he just, this is literally what he did, and he goes, you know, I just... I'm just not done sinning yet. Like, that defined his life. You know what I'm saying? Like, he just said, I'm not done sinning yet. And I said, well, neither am I. 
I'm not saying I'm going out to pursue it, but if I were to sit here and say that I'm never going to sin again, I just sinned because I lied right to your face. But this is what it is. Sin is a part of us. We think to ourselves, oh, I just, I'm never, that's just who I am. It shouldn't be. If you're a believer, it shouldn't be just who you are. I'm not saying that you're going to be perfect after this, but I, there should be a conviction in you of saying, man, this is not the man I want to be. But this is a barricade that blocks people, and this is the love of sin. Number six, men's self-righteousness. Spurgeon said, God cannot fill a full heart. When a heart is full of self, there's no room for God to fill it with his love. So there's a self-righteousness. They have not committed like the sins above. They've not done those heinous acts above, but they have filled themselves with their own self-righteousness. Notice that the Bible says our salvation comes by God's grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, the beginning of 10. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. Here we go. Lest any man should boast. That is self-righteousness. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. See, the salvation comes from him. Therefore, we are his and we are his design. Therefore, we are not to take any kind of credit for that. So self-righteousness only blinds a man from God's goodness. Why? Because all they can see is their goodness, their power. Number seven, worldliness, worldliness. Worldliness is a barricade in soul winning. Why is that? Worldliness comes in two different ways. The good times. Let's talk about the good times, all right? That is when in your life you have plenty of food on your table, you have a great job, you have a good family, you have good friends, you live in a good neighborhood, uh, your cars all run, there's no problems in your life, and everything's going great. Well, worldliness can be a barricade and blocking people from getting to the Lord can block the efforts of a soul winner because everything's good. Why, why do I need the Lord? I really have everything that I, I need. And, and you know what? Can I just say th that they're right? They're right. In this world, that is what really everybody wants. I mean, who says, when I get married, I'm going to find me a battle axe. <laughs> I'm going to find me some rude woman, <laughs> treats me like dirt. <laughs> Can't wait. I'm going to find a dead-end job, have loser friends. Oh, oh, the dream for me. No. You're growing up and you're like, I'm going to be a billionaire. I'm going to have a hot, foxy wife. We're going to have obedient kids that never get anybody any nerves. Everybody's going to come to me and want advice, and I'm going to have the perfect thing to say. We're going to live in a perfect house that never even gets any problems. That's what you think, right? You look at your wife at the altar, and you're like, baby, you really have married up here. <laughs> you know? But that, that, that's what people look for in this life. But here, here's the problem with that. There's a life to come. There's a life to come. So a worldly philosophy doesn't think about the life to come. And that's, this is where it's dangerous. Yes, you can't deny them. Yeah, you've got a great life. You've got a great family. You guys are like the Brady Bunch here in, in this life. But it's not going to pan out very well for the life to come. You know, man reaches for the riches of this world. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 15 through 17, if you go over there with me to 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, I already hear Brother Arp singing it. Don't even start, brother. Don't even, all right? 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. It says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is of the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world, here's the thing, the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So, so great, you have the perfect wife, you have the perfect kids, you have the perfect home, you have the perfect retirement. But you don't have the perfect second retirement. Hello. You've never established the rest plan for the future. Salvation is simple. Matter of fact, I've heard it said this way, simple as A, B, C, right? Admit you're a sinner. Now, this is what the worldly person in good times cannot do. They cannot admit they're a sinner because everything's good. Everything's golden. I don't need anything. And that's including God. They believe that they must believe that Christ died for their sins and arose from the grave and confessed Jesus as Lord. Now, here's the thing. They can't believe on the Lord or confess, their sin, or confess that he is the Lord until they're ready to admit that they're a sinner. What are they getting saved from? I am not going to the hospital tonight to have my heart checked out. You know why? Because there ain't nothing wrong with it. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just playing, all right? <laughs> you know? 
I'm not going to go get my back checked out. Ain't nothing wrong with my back. But you know what? I did need a checkup in my heart 22 years ago because I had a sin problem. You know, when my wife got saved, I thought, well, you know, this is good. I enjoy church. I enjoy these people. I enjoy the friendship. But it wasn't until November that God said, you need this. Like, you're lost. So I had been under the preaching from June all the way till November. I got a thick skull. But it was at that moment that, I, that God showed me, you need this. Everything you've been hearing for months and months and months, it's true. And oh, by the way, look what it has done to your wife. You know? So I had to admit that I was a sinner. I need to believe that Christ died for my sins and arose from the grave and confess Jesus Lord. You want to find that more in totality, read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But also, also we see it in bad times, in bad times. This is when there's no food. You're suffering. You're hurting. Seems like everybody around you is dying. Seems like you can't make ends meet. It seems like God doesn't care about you. This worldly thought that, that God doesn't care about you is another lie of the devil. Now, I'm not going to sit up here and say, I have the answer why that all happens, because I don't. I don't know why. I ask some of the same questions you do. Man, why did this guy die when you got this guy over here? You know what I'm saying? I don't say it begrudgingly. I just wonder sometimes. Lord, if you don't want to answer me, that's fine. But I just wonder sometimes. Both the worldly view is a barricade to soul winning, whether it's in the good times and everything's going good, or it's in the bad times and you just can't justify. I was witnessing to a guy one time, and this was his reason why he wouldn't get saved. He said, I believe what the Bible says. I believe God is real. But one day I witnessed a plane crash, and I watched these people, and I ran to the plane, and, and these people died. And I just thought to myself, how in the world would God let something like that happen? Now, that's a worldly way to look at it, but that's what's the barricade that's blocking him from trusting Christ. And lastly, let's look at uh, the last barricade in soul winning is habits and company. Habits and company. If a man is surrounded by sin, there is nothing to promote godliness. The world trains to escape from your problems. If a man goes home and is kids are crying all the time, they're always fussing, his wife is always nagging or vice versa, and there's always problems in the home, everything seems to be going wrong, the world says, just go to the bar and just kick back and relax. You get there to the bar or you get to your club or whatever the case is, and you're listening to music that certainly is not promoting godliness, not promoting turning to the Lord, not promoting going to your family. You're around other people that are just as much despair and agony as you are. What's the Bible say, or what's, the, what's that old saying, misery loves company? And the world says that you must drown those problems out. But can I tell you something? And I've had this, let me tell you, I've had this philosophy since I was a senior in high school. And I remember, and I can tell you exactly when I got it. I remember sitting in the backyard and I can share this now because this woman is now a believer. But my neighbor and I and my brother and sisters, my dad and my family had a party and they're super irresponsible when it comes to the things they leave out. And they left out a whole swimming pool of, of booze and things like that. I was never a drinker because I saw what it, it did to my family and I just didn't want any part of it even before I was saved. But anyway, and so, but all my friends that were there, I'm like, hey, you want to come over? And so they end up taking care of all that stuff. And I'll never forget seeing my neighbor in just, she was laughing, having a good time. But when all that started to wear off and she started to come down, it was just complete sobbing and agony. Why? Because the escape was fun while it lasted. But then reality smacks you in the face when you come back down. Because all that, that's why people live their life in drug-induced comas, because they can never get away. They're always chasing the high to try to get that satisfaction that they once had, and they'll never find it. The world says your habits and your company is what you need, but it's a barricade from keeping you from the gospel. You know who's a good example of this? And the Lord just gave this to me. Agrippa. Agrippa. Think about that. Paul noticed something in him, and this is nothing new. You've heard me say this probably a million times. Here's a million and one. Paul noticed something in him, didn't he? He said, thou knowest. Thou knowest it's true. So he saw something. And I can't, I can't prove this, but if Paul saw something happening in Agrippa, but then Agrippa said, thou almost persuadest me to be a Christian, 
Do you happen to think that maybe the company he was around, knowing that Festus just said, Paul, much learning doth make thee mad? Do you think maybe possibly that Agrippa was really thinking and God was working in him and then he looked around all the faces like, what are you going to do, Agrippa? Are, are, you really, are you really buying into this? And he's like, you almost got me. You're good. And Paul said what? He said, I would to God that you are not almost but altogether such as I am. And he said all to those that are listening. I know I'm totally butchering that. But the company we keep, it's a barricade. Listen, if you're here today and the people you hang out with are mostly lost people and you say you're saved, you need to find new friends. Amen. I can make some suggestions to you. <laughs> Why? Because those friends are never going to take you to the place you need to be. And I get it. Your, your thought is, oh, I'm going to be the Christian influence in their life. But that's not normally what happens. Usually they influence you to the negative. So here it is. Here is the eight things I gave you, the barricades and soul winning. Now, these are things that I've, all, I've come across, and many of you that do soul winning, you've come across them too.